Good morning. Um, my peeps. When you ask yourself a couple of questions, you look at the history of philosophy. My uh, first professor was a man named Daniel Fernald in philosophy. Actually, he wasn't my first professor. My first professor was a woman whose name I no longer remember. She taught me an intro to philosophy class, introduced me to Derek Parfit and analytic philosophy, um, as well as John Rawls and all the normal stuff you get in liberal analytic philosophy, and introduced me to G.A. Cohen. But she only taught me one course. She left my school um, for better school at the time. And a conservative professor from Emory who was uh, into analytic philosophy but was a Hegel and Nietzsche scholar um, became my primary professor when I was getting my... Um, originally was supposed to be a minor, ended up being a lot more than that um, in philosophy. Actually, he didn't get finished the minor because the logic class was so hard to get. The That's another story. I remember Fernald's turn of mind, um, Dr. Fernald's turn of mind for me was, uh, he told me that one must always understand that the most history of philosophy is useless, and when it is not useless, it is mostly pathological. And he didn't mean pathological like in philosophers are crazy. He meant the reason to study philosophers is to study where human ideas go wrong. It's a negative discourse for him. And I think about my life. Um, you know, I'm a poet. Um, I'm also trained in both critical theory and analytic philosophy to some degree. I'm trained a little bit in anthropology. I'm trained a lot in educational methodology. And in all those fields, I can tell you most of what I end up doing is the pathology of ideas and the pathology of human social formations. Where do things fail? Why do they fail? How do they fail? Um, I mean, people may be surprised about this for me, but I mean, my early philosophical career, I read more Nietzsche than Marx. I still think I've read more Nietzsche than Marx, and I've read a lot of Marx. Um, I have read, well, I have read more Marx just because of the, the amount of output and notes and, and uh, secondary source material is greater, but um, I've read Nietzsche many, many times, and... So that leads you to take both a genealogical and, for my sake, a materialist view of philosophy. But not just also materialist view of philosophy, materialist view of answers to philosophy as a concept. Um, attempts to debunk, move past, or in philosophy are often just as riddled with ideological cul-de-sacs, social limitations, um, blatant vulgar sociology, etc. And you realize something when you do this, when you apply this to human thought. Um, it's always easier to say no than yes, because you can disprove something. By logical inconsistency, by empirical non-verification, by, you know, but you can't prove a negative and you can't prove something doesn't exist. You can just increasingly lower its probability or prove that it is logically infeasible. Um, or show how it is historically unlikely to work. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit, though, about Analytics and Dialectics. And I'm going to talk about my pathology in regards to two books today. I'm going to suggest you read these two books. Um, not because I agree with everything in them. Um, but I was talking to Doug Lane this morning. Um, 
and my normal sort of frustration with with the various forms of Marxist and socialist discourse right now, particularly now that there's more, you know, um, progressive caucus and DSA adjacent members in, in Congress, and we can see how little difference there actually are from the prior three generations of the same. Um, and that was inspiring me to just say, look, our milieu, and I call it a milieu advisedly, is distorted. And Doug replied to me, and, you know, I'm going to quote him verbatim here. When you see how many ways the project to overcome capitalism has failed, not just the Marxist project, but the bourgeois projects too, it becomes understandable why people treat emancipatory politics as an accessory to their personal lifestyles and as an excuse for acting out. But at the same time, when you realize that the bourgeois order itself, these utopian dreams necessitate the dream that includes Marxist insights seem entirely justifiable. Now, that's Doug being actually brilliant. And it gets to a problem that we see in socialism. There is a truth to the anti-Marxist phrase that a lot of Marxists use Marxism, um, and particularly Marxist historiography, to be able to comment on everything and know nothing. But there is a way in which you do have to do a little bit of pathology to understand the way things are. Because a lot of the binds that Marxists get into not only resonate with Marxists, I'm always pointing out that if I find... 20 Maoist orgs and 20 Trotskyist orgs, I'll have a different internal vocabulary, but I'll find matching positions between the orgs on any social question or any economic question if I try hard enough. So despite the fact that there is massive differences on historical explanations, that their actual substantive and functional positions not only contradict each other, you look at different kinds of Maoists, they're all over the map and highly contradictory, same with different kinds of Trotskyists. Um, but also that, functionally speaking, the difference between the Maoists and the Trotskyists are actually not as different as between the Trotskyists and themselves and the Maoists and themselves, despite a completely different, you know, um, intellectual tradition coming out of Marxism. And what Doug realized is this is true for bourgeois and socialist development. I mean... The Marxists haven't been the only utopians, and not all bourgeois powers of bourgeois thought has wanted to just perpetuate bourgeois ideology. It always does. But that's not its only dream. I mean, it took a reactionary like Don Clancho to point out to me that a lot of times... Um, the, the bourgeois wants to end its, the bourgeois philosophical position is to actually end itself too. You know, into the administrative state, so you don't need democracy anymore, or into the pure market, or into um, any number of visions. I mean, technocracy, which, which its cybernetic research actually partly comes out of the Soviet Union, but you see technocratic ideas coming from people like Lewis Mumford are uh, cybernetic ideas like Stafford Beer, both developing in parallel to and response to similar ideas that are coming out of deviant wings of the communist movement. When I say deviant, I don't necessarily mean that they weren't good Marxists. Some of them were actually great Marxists, but you see from, um, from, all kind from both in the Soviet Union and in parallel groups outside of it, both um, in left communist groups, um, like early Burdigas movements and its organic centralism and its view of the administrated Russian state, um, and its idea of the communist man to to some of the the ideas of real subsumption coming out of Italian autonomism. You see that most of what that if you take the marxist jargon away from it or the hegelian justifications away from it um it's functionally very similar to things that have happened in dissident movements in the bourgeois world such as um technocracy inc um the cybernetic planning movement 
um, complexity theory management, etc. Now, this may all seem very abstract to you, and you may not seem how it's related to me complaining about the democratic socialist. All right. I've talked about parasocial relationships on the Zero Books channel, and I have noticed that the new progressives all use Twitter and speak very highly progressive rhetoric, but their votes are in line with their party. And while there'll be people who are adjacent to them outside, um, it even have some political power like Kasama Sawat, once those people get into the, um, the disciplinary apparatus of Congress um, at the federal level, they tend to operate with the same game theoretical framework um, that the um, that the rest of the progressives before them do. I mean, Nancy Pelosi started in the Progressive Caucus. My point in this is to point out that someone like Jenny Dora is accurate in saying, like, they won't take a stand. And this is not to excuse them for not taking a stand. In fact, it's kind of deplorable how much signaling can be given on um, social media and people buy it and how they never hold anyone accountable to any kind of programmatic line. Um, you know, when people ask me, should we run candidates or whatever, I'm always like, you're not even at that point. You've got to be able to hold people to a line just on denying the votes on practical grounds, like on a, on a united front line ground, like running your own candidates, you're not there yet, right? That was the whole point. If you run your candidates without changing a lot of the fundamentals of the system, um, you're not going to be able to do anything, which is why in, you know, classical Bolshevik, you know, analysis on electoralism, how you stood in regards to that changed depending on the time period. Now, I have my critiques of what the Bolsheviks actually did, um, but it's not insignificant that that was drawn as a tactical, not an absolute line. But I wanted to talk a little bit about pathology for a second. And I'm going to talk about three books and go into some ideas. So, the first book I'm going to mention, I don't have the physical copy for it. It's on my Kindle. Um, but it is um, Another Marx by Marcelo Musto. And Musto has gone through the recent German and Italian works um, on the various Marx translations and impaired the critical notes with his biography. Um, one thing Musto points out is Marx's view of alienation is fundamentally different than, um, than Hegel's, um, or at least his, con his focus of concern is fundamentally different than Hegel's. This is not a particularly new observation. But this is true even in the early works and, you know, before any sort of, quote, epistemic break happened, unquote, as the Altasarian tradition may have you believe. Um, but to understand that difference in alienation, you need to understand dialectics as a, like, a process. And I'm not talking about dialectics in the way that it's used in Marxist circles, which is basically a magic word in the conversation. Dialectics in ancient philosophies, and not just in Greek, but it also has a concurrent tradition in Indian, um, both Indian uh, logical disputation, Chinese logical disputation, and, um, and in uh, Abhidharmic or Buddhist logic. When I say Chinese logical disputation, the, the logician school of the Warren States period uh, used, used dialectical arguments, but... Um, it, and it is used in Confucianism, but the focus of Confucianism is not as uh, tied to logic um, as its primary form. But in all those places, you had um, something analogous to dialectics and analytics. Dialectics in ancient philosophies is not is debating in a dialogical but oppositional way where you don't define your terms. The terms are defined emergent in the debate. And why that is the case is because the 
the term is what is actually in question. All right. Um, so in analytics, if you know anything about analytics, you can hide stuff in your categories pretty easily. You can pretend something is a tautology that isn't. Um, and this can be used even in scientific methodologies in really pernicious ways, you know, neoclassical economics and rationality, which rationality is totally circular, right? Um, you can hide stuff in your definitions. And dialectic is much harder to do that. But it's also harder to understand exactly what's being talked about. You know, as I've talked many times about in Marx, Marx doesn't define a lot of the key terms, uh, particularly after the manifesto. If you read early, early, early Engels stuff, they actually start off with definitions, and Marx changes that methodology, partly from the influence of Hegel and partly from the fact that Marx said he didn't want to write a single sentence that, that couldn't be proved ten different ways. You can't prove an axiom. You can't prove a tautology. So Marx depended on dialectics. These categories needed to be emergent. But dialectics had changed its meaning under Hegelian circumstances. And so instead of just coming out of a debate in Hegelian dialectics, um, and this had already kind of begun in, you know, the Kantian, Fichtean um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis model. But Hegel puts the debate as the entirety of emergence in history. So what you have is the first time that that um, philosophy is seen as a debate which is playing out in the historical development of the world. Now, Hegel did this for religious reasons and ultimately thought that these manifestations were, you know, like, you know, emergent from God and stuff like that. Um, this is a very simplified view of it. It's, it, it, there are legit debates over how, how orthodox is he Hegel's theism is, but it's important to remember Hegel thought he was a good Lutheran. Um, and Hegel's framing of historical frameworks was often questionable. He would often comment on things he didn't really know that much about. But you also saw concurrent developments in Nietzsche, whose idea of genealogy was similarly historical. Um, although, like Hegel, often based on projections and myths and taking myths at their word, but Nietzsche didn't think those myths were a manifestation of some absolute reality. Marx comes along and influenced by a bunch of different things from Epicureanism, which is what he studied in, uh, as a university student um, when he gave up on law. Um, and yes, Marx was first studying to be a lawyer. Um, he gave up on law after his dad died. And I got that. I actually hadn't contextualized that part of Marx's life. Most of the political stuff I've read about contextualizing Marx's work has been based on his political life. Um, this is the works of Hal Draper, um, his five volume, you know, um, History of Marxist Theory Revolution, which goes into all the political side notes. It's really helpful here. Some of the work by, um, by uh, Michael Heinrich, whose exegesis I don't already agree with, but his contextual work is excellent. But um, Musto puts a lot of the biographical details in context. You know, and why wouldn't you use it? Well, a person's biography is still part of their you know, historical material conditions. What Marx does is, um, is partly inspired to, hit to moving to Paris um, after being unable to procure a university position after a bunch of um, university reforms done um, under, this, under the beginnings of the Prussian rule, um, Marx goes to Paris and sees highly, you know, highly fermented. And at the same time, he's arguing with a lot of the Hegelians who were his first interlocutors, Feuerbach, Bruno Bauer, Max Stirner, et cetera. Uh, Bruno Bauer, excuse me. Um, and if you know anything about like higher critical religious studies, those names are probably more familiar to you from the from that and the, the beginnings of higher critical stuff and biblical scholarship um, more than they are in um, political debates. But nonetheless, that's who Marx was arguing with. 
And at the same time, he did he was writing um, his Philosophical and Economic Manuscripts of 1844, which were more or less his research notes. There's a reason why they weren't published, even though they're super useful. And they were written concurrently, according to Musto, in the recent scholarship um, on the dating to um, when he was writing The Holy Family and his big arguments with the left Hegelians. And in this time period, you see Marx really develop a new theory of alienation. Now, um, and that alienation is based off of uh, off of property relations, partially from Perhun, because he points out that all the political economy he's reading outside of Perhunism, which Marx doesn't have a lot of time for, um, assumes private property, doesn't explain it. Um, But Marx's theory of alienation is fourfold. If you excuse me here, I'm actually looking at the passage where Musto points out the fourfold theory. So one, um, the, the proletariat is alienated from the produce of their labor. They're alienated from their own labor power. They're alienated from um, they're alienated from capital as a system. And they're alienated from their own historical praxis. Okay. That's not how Marx words that, but that's how Musto reads it. Now, I find that interesting because Musto points out that this is very different than the Hegelian, the Hegelian phenomenological sense of alienation, where objectification, which happens with any mind perceives the other, it alienates one naturally. Um... Now, it's unclear to me whether Marx rejected Hegel's concept of alienation. I don't think he did. Ah, he, he did, because he still has alienation from species being. That's the one I was misremembering. Couldn't find the quote. Um, the, you know, but that... <clears throat> I'm having to think on the fly here. But that... Um, but that this form of alienation was historically specific. So the general and thus natural alienation is no longer the only driving force. Um, whether Marx in, intends these, these alienations in capital social relations as um, extensions of the subject-object alienation in Hegel are as something completely different is a little unclear to me. Um, I've read Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy in general, and it's not there. And um, as many people point out, Marx was also working on a critique of Hegel's theory of law that was never finished, um, or even attempted, I think, other than some of the notes in the, um, the philosophical and economic manuscripts, and then later his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, um, which is, you know, Hegel's rational fate theory. Um, so, you know, you have that form of that critique, but I'm not sure if that's actually the only thing Marx originally wrote, Musto doesn't actually, I mean, wanted to originally write, and Musto doesn't actually say based on the biographical data. Now, I say all that because <sighs> dialectics also has problems, because you can, not only can you, you can never define the terms. If you, ne if there's never a consensus given in the oppositional terms, it's hard to know what things actually mean. This led to, like, 
basically two attempts to deal with it, which are structural Marxism and analytical Marxism. Now, I'm not going to deal so much with structural Marxism, but I am going to deal with analytical Marxism. And then I think this book by Tom Mayer, Volume 1, Contemporary Social Theory, Analytical Marxism, which is a hard to find ish now, and you can't get it online, it's from 1994, is the best job of, of doing this pathology of thought using the categories emergence from analytical Marxism itself. And so what you learn from this book is a lot of the analytical Marxists do not meet their own criterion of debate. That they fall into cul-de-sacs and they accidentally or intentionally sneak um, assumptions in. Um, equilibrium, for example, is assumed. And there's no reason if you've ever read a single system theory or temporal system theory uh, versions of Marxism to assume that Marx assumes equilibrium, or that even economic econ, uh, economics should in the first place. Um, methodological individualism, collective action, and aggregate action is dealt with in here, and it's something that I'm very interested in because those are separate things. In fact, to understand, uh, this is going to come up in a video that I'm making actually probably today for Zero Books where you have to parse out um, uh, the class in itself and class for itself problem. And the class for itself is when the class becomes a conscious or um, aggregately conscious collective actor. And that's kind of hard to explain. Um, which is different than the class interest in aggregate. And when Marxists talk about false consciousness, which is the most easy thing to abuse in history, often they're doing a bait and switch between, you know, the, the consciousness of, of the effect of acting in aggregate versus, like, what I want you to do right now because I think it should be theoretically what is true regardless of what the class or you as an individual think. And so this lays out all the problems and all the logical problems that come from analytical Marxism, and why it kind of ended up being a cul-de-sac that split off into different um, theoretical Marxist frameworks. Believe it or not, things that you know really oppose analytical Marxism, such as world systems theory, um, are um, Brennerite political Marxism have a direct relation to analytical Marxist research, and they were often collaborators on the early forms of research. This book goes through all of that. It's very useful, more useful even than reading the text themselves it, without the context, because you can forget to do the test. And in this book, um, which is aided by David Bentham, Marxist in the Face of Fascism, Writings by Marxism and Fascism in the Interwar Period, is the ultimate in pathology, because you see that nobody was entirely right. Um, the the The... The preface and the introduction is worth the book alone, but going through the responses of fascism in Italy, um, uh, Gramsci, Bordiga, Reddick, um, and Tagalotti, I think, right, um, really points out how off everybody was. Going through... Um, Stalin's writings, which shift wildly between 1924 and 1936, um, going through communist in opposition and the social democracy's inability to deal with it, as well as the inability of third periodism to create a even united front with the fascists, and then the big switch after third periodism to the exact opposite, the popular front, is all dealt with. And you can see how, in some ways, every single group got parts of it wrong. For example, Trotsky and the Austro-Marxists seem probably the most, some of the most correct, um, with Bordiga being fairly correct on the results of the national, of the Popular Front as the primary form of anti-fascism. And I bring this up because this inter introduces two different sets of pathologies. One, you have a historical genealogy that is largely academic. And the other, you have a historical genealogy that is actually very much rooted in real political battles at the time, and both end up getting into contradictory um, social, uh, social responses. And if you study liberal and even conservative responses to fascism, for example, you'll actually find parallels in their inability to deal with it.
understanding those parallels are important. You know, yes, I'm overwhelmingly focused on Marxism and anarchism and things in the socialist tradition, but I actually read a lot outside of that tradition. In fact, as I've been hinting all the time, I read a lot of ancient history, right? And so one of the things, if you want to be a good sociologist and come up with, you know, the differences between times and not do something lazy like Foucault's epistemes, where you assume that there's just totally different worldviews between time periods and how they move into each other is not a, a concern, are vulgar modes of production being the you know, being the only consideration, something that Marx actually explicitly says in both younger and older periods shouldn't be read vulgarly. Um, but Marx always does say that the reproduction of society is what drives you know, you know, most social development. And if ideas emerge during a time period that can't be copacetic with the material reproduction of that society, those ideas tend to not survive or not be enactable. This gives one a kind of dismal view of human sciences, you know, and I've actually talked about if you think the economics has a, is a dismal profession, um, anything involves human complexity because it's necessarily complex. Um, and not just like, you know, there's so many different actors and so many different systems and so many different systems you can look at in a scientific manner to kind of reach these conclusions. So to get back to my point, you know, when, why Doug Lane's quote made me think about Dr. Fernald and going through these, these three recommendations here. Um, is it any surprising that, that socialists who are, who are averse to game theory for usually theoretical reasons can't understand the game theoretical limitations of, of, uh, of their strategy in Congress when it's abundantly clear you know, I've spelled it out several times. Well, that frustration, of course, leads people to holding on to a lifestyleism. Because even a lot of the answers to this, like, you know, so you will about Jimmy Dore and someone's going to do mine. Like, you have to denounce him. But I think his answer to this is, an on, you know, is basically another third party that would resemble the Greens. And, you know, the when Peter Camejo gave up on working within the Democratic Karen Tonight framework, for example, and and ended up going into the Greens, it it would resemble that. But with Chris Hedges and a bunch of Gen X figures, as opposed to pre-Boomer and Boomer figures, right? Um, I think you need to remember that. There's a reason why it's easier to say no than yes to something. If you get frustrated with people's critiques um, because they don't provide you with an answer, well, that doesn't make the critique wrong. Maybe the answer isn't obvious yet. Maybe in some ways the entire question is framed in such a way that you're pursuing something that's dumb. Now, I don't obviously think about socialism or I wouldn't be a socialist, but I do think you have to really ask yourself some hard questions about like tactics, strategies, assumptions, because a lot of socialists, frankly, start with their assumptions first and try to prove them. You know, they look for historical anecdotes to prove them and this, that, and the other. And, and it's, it is a confirmation bias machine. And when that gets frustrated, they often it often becomes a way of making an academic career or social posturing, right? Um, or an excuse for acting out and getting beat by the cops and enjoying the jouissance of acting in the street while effectively changing very little. The pathology is what comes first. In my mind, understanding this negatively. Yes, we have to have virtuous social commitments. And that's why I always talk about like virtues. And virtues are not just ethics. Um, they're strengths. But you also need to hone your analytical mind and be able to take things apart and hone your dialectical mind and see how these things have emerged in histories and what logics and systems are limiting them. If you can't do that, you're going to have a real hard time with a lot of this stuff. And if you just hold on to a tradition because it's what you want to believe, then you might as well be religious because it's the same functional pareidolia kind of mind operating system.
that confirms your own individual identity and confirms your own choice. And believe it or not, that's not even that stupid people do. This is something that smart people do. Let's do it more. When I say that, you know, it takes a certain kind of intelligent person to be certain kinds of wrong. That's what I mean. This is a long video, and I need to record that class for itself and end of class for the Rising Hamburg because I'm supposed to have a video out on Monday. Um, there will be a live stream tomorrow night at 7. I have a guest from the YouTubes. It will be something I'm going to do probably once once every week or two. Um, I like doing interviews. I miss it. Um, but I also don't want to polish up and do a podcast. You guys can get rough, kind of raw interviews here. All right. Take care. Uh, recap real fast. Another Marx by Mario Musso. And he also, there's a book he's written on the old Marx I haven't read yet, but you might want to take that out. By Marcello Musso, not Mario. Uh, Anti-Italian battles on my part. Oh, and spaghetti communism or whatever. Um, the book Analytical Marxism by Tom Mayer, which is a attempt to apply analytical Marxist methodology to itself and explain the original problems and Marxist in the face of fascism. By, uh, edited by David Beetham. Um, these will really help you get to some of the points that I'm getting into here today. If you like these kinds of book reviews, um, I'll you know do recommendations like this all the time, not just the poetry ones. But um, that's where you start. Don't trust people's tweets. If people are tweeting to you but are structurally unable to vote, and look, I get it. Like, as a side note, before I like, sign off, there is a logic where it is harder for progressives to to stop, um, to actually stand up, even when they outnumber one or two moderates, to to moderates. Because the moderates can run the Republicans, the progressives can run the nobody. You haven't figured that out yet. You don't know basic game theory, right? But there is a way in which sometimes burning down the house is actually preferable. To not. And I'm not going to argue about it on the current relief bill. It's. Um, there's a lot of assumptions there that, for example, that if if the progressives stopped it and then forced to negotiate that people would negotiate with them. Um, that could always lead to Joe Manchin just changing party affiliation. You have to be realistic about that, but that should have told you that that uh, this strategy was premature and that unless you were willing to be just this ruthless in holding your people accountable, even when it's not their fault, particularly when they talk a good game on Twitter but can't do anything about it, that, like, that's all they're doing is messaging. The Overton window stuff is quickly moves from changing the conversation to gaslighting and redefining socialism as progressivism, as progressivism, as centerism. Like, don't buy into it. You have to be hard-minded about this. And again, a lot of these abstract questions I've been talking about, about the development of alienation and the theory doesn't seem relevant to that, but it, it really kind of is. Because we can see how this strategy is historically limited. And it was obvious that it was. And we have plenty of historical examples about why. Anyway, for real, take care. You can find me here at Varm Blog. You can um, subscribe to Zero Books. Subscribe here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at SketPoet. That's S K E P O E T. Um, and you can follow me at Former People Magazine on WordPress, uh, where I do. Um, literary stuff and show back up here tomorrow because I'll be talking to someone that you're interested in hearing from. Take care.